Good morning. morning. It's so good to see everyone. I just want to welcome you as we start a new series called Famous Last Words. We're going to be looking at Jesus' last words from the cross, uh, just one week at a time. And I I want to tell you, I'm so excited for this series for two reasons. First of all, uh, for myself, I'm a follower of Jesus. And as I dig into these last words and see how they apply to my life and what they mean for me, uh, it's just really preparing my heart for Easter. Y'all know Easter's only four weeks away, right? Did y'all know that? Yeah. Oh, mark your calendars. You need to know that. And one of the reasons is, is because your friends and family will come that weekend with you, if no other weekend out of the year. So four weeks. But th- I, I'm so excited. This is preparing my heart for that journey. And the second reason that I'm really excited is because I don't think I could teach on anything that would add more value to your faith journey wherever you're at in your faith journey, over the next few weeks to get ready for Easter, for the the day of Jesus' resurrection, that he came back to life. And some of you may say, well, I'm not a follower of Christ. Uh, That's great. This is the series for you to be here in, to see what he has done for you. And ultimately, when we get to Easter Sunday, Easter weekend, um, that we're celebrating and understanding fully the impact that it has for us right here in 2016. And I want to welcome Church Online as well. I'm so glad you guys are joining us. So the series is called Famous Last Words. And we're going to start with Jesus' last words called, why, where he says, why have you forsaken me? Would you read that with me? Why have you forsaken And And as we look at his last words, ultimately today, I want to look at the why. Th- this has so much power to change your life, to change our life. When we understand this, and we're willing to make the shift that he points us toward here. He says, why? And a lot of us, we have why. I don't know, you guys may be like me. Uh, I have a sneaking a suspicion that some of you are where when I go through something bad or things aren't going my way, I kind of say, why is this happening to me? You know, why me, God? In fact, there are times I'll, I'll think things like, what did I do? You know, as though God is like this whack-a-mole God up there that, you know what I'm saying? You ever feel like that? You feel like, oh, I must have done something, and boom, and you pop up over here, and man, that's not what he's doing at all. He, he has a plan for your life. And if we can make the shift that we're going to talk about today that Jesus points us toward from the cross, it has the power to change everything about how we live our lives and living out his purpose and his plan for our life. Now, I want to start by just giving some context of where Jesus says this. Jesus has been beaten. He's been falsely accused. In fact, Scripture tells us that he was beaten so bad that he didn't even look human. You couldn't recognize him as human. Uh, His back was so beaten that most theologians will tell you that uh, the meat, the exposure of his, his muscle would have looked like hamburger meat. It was just so beaten and bloody. And now he's been crucified, nails driven through his, his wrist, his hands, and through his feet, and he's hanging on the cross. That's where we're at when we pick up in Matthew 27. It says, a sign was fastened to the cross above Jesus' head, announcing the charge against him. It read this, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Now, as he's hanging there, uh, he, he's been stripped of his clothes. They, did, they would do that to shame, shame you. He died uh, an accused criminal. Uh, even though he had not committed a crime. And now the people are walking by, and hear what the people say. The people passing by shouted abuse. Look at you now. If you're the Son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. And, and maybe you've had that, in those of you who are followers of Christ in your faith journey, where people have said, uh, I thought God was going to take care of you. And you kind of get in that circumstance or that situation where you feel like, why is this happening to me? And they're saying, well, where's God now? And that's what they're doing. They're they're just shouting these insults to Jesus. And then we we see a shift in Scripture because now it goes from the people who are just passing by to the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And the the religious leader said this, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Look at these next three words. This is like the pinnacle of the mockery. Let's read it together. He trusted God. One more time, he trusted, he trusted God. And that's really what this talk, when we see Jesus' famous last words, why have you forsaken me? That's what this is all about. It's an issue of trust. Now, Jesus trusted God all the way through. But for us, a lot of times we have a problem with saying, do I really 
trust God. So the religious leader says, well, you trusted God, so let God rescue him if he wants him. For he said, I'm the son of God. Uh, Now the mockery just, it goes to a new level. Yeah, you trust in him. You trust in God. But look at you now. And maybe you've had that. Maybe you've felt that. You've taken steps of faith. and You've put your trust in God. And circumstances didn't work out like you thought they would. And not only have others said that about you, but you felt it yourself. Lord, I put my trust in you. But things aren't working out like I thought they would. And you have that question of why. Why, why, why is this happening to me? Why, why doesn't he love me anymore? Why doesn't she love me anymore? Why is this happening to my kids? Why, why is this happening to my health, to my finances? Why, why did I lose that job? That's the job I loved, I wanted. Why didn't I get that job? So many whys. And if we can take this next step, and God would encourage us to, we take this next step, this changes everything. This word trust is, trusted is the word uh, patho uh, in the Greek language. Uh, the, the original text here is written in Greek. Some of the New Testament's written in Aramaic. But in Greek, that word trusted, Jesus trusted in God. He trusted in him. It means to have full confidence in, to be convinced that he's God, that I can trust him with my life, to rely on him uh, with inward certainty. Everybody say certainty. To be certain that God's got my life in his control. And that, more than anything, we need to be certain that he's got a good plan for us. He promises us that. He says, I've got a plan for you. It's good. It's a, a hope and a future. I've got a plan for you. And that Jesus trusted him that much, and that's where he would want us to live. As we follow him, man, aren't you glad you're not following Jeff or a live church? You follow Jesus, and we want to point you to that. And as we follow him to say, I'm trusting you so much that no matter what happens in my life, I'm certain that you're in control of my life. And the shift here that we need to see happen will take us to living at this level of saying, okay, God, instead of why me, I want to know what. What are you doing in my life? In fact, that's what I want to unpack over the next few minutes. The more I trust God, the less I ask why, and the more I ask what. It's not that you won't ask why, and Jesus himself asked why here on the cross. It's, it's as though he embraces our humanity in that moment because Jesus already knew the why. He knew it from beginning to end. He t- had told the disciples over and over, hey, this is what's going to happen to me, and here's why. But he embraces it because he relates to us so much. Aren't you glad Jesus relates to us? It's not that he's just out there somewhere and he has no clue what's going on. He totally re- relates to us as fully God, fully human. It's not that we won't ask why, but the faster we can get to the what. And the what is, what are you doing in me, Lord? What are you doing through me? What do you want to do around me? What do you want to do to my character? And to really trust him that way. Let's read this together. The more I trust God, the less I ask why, and the more I ask what. The less I ask why, the more I ask what. Now let's continue on. Here we are in Matthew 27, and we see this, that Jesus is going to point us toward this. Because every, every word that he said from the cross, with the exception of dealing with his mother, and we won't deal with that in this series. Uh, we'll, we'll come across it, but I'm not going to spend time on that. But all the other words that he spoke, his famous last words, are quoting scripture, prophetic scripture from the past. And Jesus did that here at this point. He's quoting Psalm 22. So here we, we are at noon, darkness fell. This darkness is described as like it's dark at midnight kind of darkness, fell across the whole land until three o'clock. So it lasts for three hours. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lam Shabakani. He says, which means, let's read it together, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And you can see the pain in Jesus' words here. To feel abandoned by God. Some of you felt that. Some of you are there right now. You feel like, why, why are you forsaking me, God? Why are you abandoning me? But to know this, that God never abandons you. In fact, the, fact, the truth is Jesus 
went to the cross and was abandoned by the Father. The Father turned his back on him because Jesus became sin. He became my sin. And when he becomes my sin, the Father, being a holy, perfect God, turns his back because he cannot look on sin. Now he looks at me through Jesus. So the Father turns his back, and Jesus, knowing what's going to happen, knowing this is going to happen, still cries out with the pain, the feelings that we often have. Why? And I, I want you to see this. He is quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. It's word for word. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Now, we only see him call out the first line of Psalm 22 on the cross. And as we go through this today, I want us to walk through. He's pointing us toward, he's prophetically fulfilling uh, Psalm 22. And you'll see some of this. I'm going to read some more of it later on. You'll see how he fulfills it all. But it's important for us to read the end of the story. He doesn't point us there. Uh, just so that we can say, why me, why me, why me? He points us there so that we can see, God, you've got a plan for my life. And this was part of God's plan for his life. Now, as you wrestle with why, we're all at different places. Some of you have come out of the why. In fact, some of you would say, well, this isn't as important for me today because everything's good in my life right now. I'm, I'm blessed. And I would encourage you to know that you know that someday you're going to be going through something again where you're going to feel like, oh, why me? Why is this happening to us? I don't know about you, but all the things where I've asked why, I didn't plan them. <laughs> I didn't say, well, someday in my life, my goal is to get to this place of crisis, and I'll ask why. They are always surprised me, but they're never a surprise to God. And I, I want you to experience this and feel this and see this through the eyes of three people who went through some tremendous crisis of asking why. I want you to listen to, to Lisa Scott and uh, Deidre's story. What's this? Hi, my name is Lisa, and in July of 2008, my husband and I went in for a routine ultrasound at 20 weeks. And we found out then that our baby didn't have a heartbeat. <laughs> Hi, my name is Scott. About It was the early morning I got a phone call and it was about my grandson being taken to the hospital. And he was my little buddy. He was, he was the world to me. I have other grandkids, but, but Nova was, he was special. Uh, my name is Deidre and um, my father sexually abused me until I was eight years old. Um, and he also beat the living daylight out of my mother. And when we got there, and they had just had just gotten him resuscitated, they admitted him into the, his room, and and it was at that point that I was like, God, why, why? He's, he's not even three years old. Why would you take this precious boy? It made me feel betrayed by God. It made me feel dirty. It made me feel like God left me um, out there by myself. Um, and I asked why. Um, I couldn't understand why God would allow something like that to happen to me. It was about a week when, when he finally uh, passed away. So that was the hardest thing that we ever had to go through. And it was the hardest point in my life. And I questioned and questioned and questioned why why was this baby taken from us when I never got to hold him or kiss his face? Over the next few moments, I, I, I want to take you to a place of feeling uh, that God is in control and that we do have the Easter victory. But for the next few moments, would you just be honest enough with yourself to say, this is my why. There, there's something I've either gone through, and maybe we, we press it down, we hide it. But to be real honest and say, God, I, I don't understand why. And I'm wrestling with that. And, and as we talk about this, this is a trust issue. And, and it's not that we need to feel bad, but that this is a normal part of how we get to trust. And Jesus led the way. What is that why for you? 
it may be even for you that it's just seeing what's going on in the world. Why do children suffer? Why is there a group like ISIS? If God is God, why? And we've got to get to a place of trust. Sometimes it feels hard. But the quicker, the more that we can learn to do that in a quicker way, to go from why to God, what are you doing? I'm certain, my trust is in you. The more we will live out his plan for our lives. And his plan is good. Let's read this again together. The more I trust God, the less I ask why, and the more I ask what. Here's what I would challenge you to do, especially this week, for a week. Every time you get to that moment where you say why, Turn to Psalm 22, open it up and read it, and see the whole picture. And, and maybe you say, God, I, I feel like I'm struggling with my faith, my trust, because I'm asking why. I've got to have your help to get to the place where I can see what you're doing in me and through me. Would you help me? You see, our problem is we don't see the whole picture, and we need to remember that. We only see part of the story. Would you all agree with that? I don't understand it all. This is kind of like uh, going to the rodeo parade, and I know that's weird. Some of you uh, online, uh, if you're not from Tucson, you don't understand. We're like the only place in the world that gets off school for rodeo, (laughs) right? It's kind of weird, although that's not as weird. Somebody told me from first service, they said, you know what? We came from South Dakota, and we got a whole week off school to go pheasant hunting. (laughs) I thought, okay, that's a little weirder to me even than rodeo. I I don't know. Uh, Any, really, any excuse to get out of school, I do know that, right? When I was a kid, man, I'm telling you, I sneezed. I'm not going to school. Um, So whatever it takes. But, you know, this is like going to the parade, and you're sitting on the corner, and you can only see this part of the parade and this part of the parade. You can't see the whole parade. And suddenly the parade stops, and you're wondering, what happened? We know it's not over. And God's like, he's like living, he's like the helicopter above. He sees the whole parade, and he's got this. And for me, it's a place of getting to where I trust that he's got this. I know I can only see a couple steps, but God sees the whole of my life. So I need to remember that. In fact, we see it in Hebrews for Jesus. It says, because of the joy, everybody say joy. Because of the joy awaiting him, this is Jesus, he endured the cross. he, He knew the whole picture because he's God. And yet, even he relates to our humanness, and he says, why have you forsaken me? And because of the joy, what's that joy? The joy is that you and I would be forgiven, that we would have a right relationship with God the Father, the guilt and shame of our past is gone. Anybody feeling that joy? And because of that joy, Jesus endured the cross. This is what it's like. Uh, My son Joel, uh, when he was eight years old, uh, he had this wart on his hand. And uh, it would keep popping up. We'd get rid of it, pop up. Well, we were on vacation in Colorado, and my brother-in-law was vacationing with us. We just love them. He's a pastor as well, so we really relate a lot. And we were all there as families vacationing together. And that particular week, Joel's little thing had popped back up, and I said, okay, we're going to take care of this. So have you ever bought those freeze things? Yeah, so I bought one of those things, and I said, this is it, Joel. We're going to take care of this for you, buddy. And He's eight years old, and I put that thing on. He's like, oh, Dad, this hurts. It's so painful. And, you know, isn't that how we feel sometimes? Oh, God, why are you doing this? It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. Why are you doing this to me? And that's how Joel felt. And finally, I took it off, and I realized, oh, I didn't hold it on long enough. And I said, this is it. We're taking care of this today, Joel. And he's already like, Dad, this hurts. Why are you doing this to me? And I told my brother-in-law, Brian, I said, Brian, I know this is going to hurt him, but I say, but you hold him down. I'm taking care of this. He's not going to deal with this again in his life. We held him down, and, you know, he had no understanding as an 8-year-old why dad, who says he loves him, would do that to him. We've talked about it since. In fact, last night, Joel was running the camera for me, and uh, we had the conversation afterwards after talking about the story, and he says, I, I get it now. I sure didn't feel it at the moment. And that's the way we are. We don't see the whole picture. And so we're saying, why, God? And God, our loving Heavenly Father, is saying, you don't understand. I love you so much. I've got this plan for your life, and it's good. It's what I'm doing for you and in you. I mean, haven't we all experienced that where we've said things like, 
uh, a couple years after we lost that job or something that we loved, and we like, that was the worst thing that happened. And a few years later, we're going, that's the best thing that ever happened to me because it opened up new opportunities. So we need to remember, we don't see the whole picture right now. Jesus is on the cross, and he saw the whole picture, so he had joy. And if we can get that place of trust, we can live in joy. He disregarded the shame of the cross, uh, and now he's seated at the place of the Father because he, he had joy because he saw this is where he was leading him. We see Paul talking about this in Corinthians as well for us. He says, we see what? We see things imperfectly. Isn't that true? We don't see the whole story as in a cloudy mirror, but then we will see things it was, we see everything with perfect clarity. When is that going to happen? When we see Jesus face to face. All the things where we're going, why, why, why? We're going to go, oh, thank you, God. You are awesome that you did that in me. This is what you were doing through me and dealing with my character. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. Let's read it together. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. We're going to know it completely in that moment, but it won't happen until that moment. So what do I do with it in the meantime? How do I live in trust? Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? And we can relate to that. Isaiah, these are God's words to us. And this, again, just confirms we don't get the whole picture. He says, my thoughts, let's read this one together. Church Online, join us. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. So I I, I don't think like him. I don't see the whole picture. But I've got to get to the place in my faith that I can trust that he's in control and he's got this. And that he has my best in mind. Here's what I'd like to do. Jesus said, he he says, why have you forsaken me, God? He's quoting uh, Psalm 22. I want to read some more of this psalm to you. Because I'm getting ready to show you how we can go from the why to the what and the power that it has for our lives to trust him that way. It's a trust issue. So I, want you to read, I want you to hear just a little bit of the rest of what Jesus has quoted here. And it's not an accident. He's pointing us right towards Psalm 22. It's a prophetic uh, chapter about him. He starts out, verse 1, you've seen it, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night you hear my voice, but I find no reply. Some of you are there. You've been there. You have a loved one who's there. The very next verse, verse 3 says this, though. Yet. Everybody say yet. I love what comes after the yet. He says, oh, this is so, why are you forsaking me? And then he says, yet you are holy you are enthroned on the praises of israel and this this is exactly how we do it then he goes right back to and i'm like this where i feel like i'm asking the why 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 and then i'm going oh god you got this and the very next moment i'm right back at it and that's what happens here as david writes this prophecy everyone who sees me mocks me they sneer and shake their heads saying Is this the one who relies on the Lord? Now, these words are sounding very familiar. What happened to Jesus on the cross, isn't it? Then then let the Lord save him. If the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. Very next verse, verse 9. Yet, yet you brought me safely from my mother's womb, and you led me to trust you at my mother's breast. You see, Jesus points back to this verse. He's fulfilling it, and he wants us to see that this is, he lives this out this is a, while he embraces our feelings of sometimes feeling like, where's God? To be able to trust God so much that we can praise him and say, God, I trust you. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't even like it usually. But I trust you that you're doing what's best for me. What do you want to do through me? He says, you've been my God from the moment I was born. I love this. David, again, this is how I feel. I'm going back and forth, and he goes right back in verse 14. My life is poured out like water, and again, we see the picture of Jesus on the cross. My bones are out of joint, which we know of Jesus' crucifixion. My heart is like wax. It's melting. My strength is dried up like uh, sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You've left me here in the dust to die. 
Man, uh, we've never hung on a cross, but we've sure felt those words before. I can't go on. Why me, Lord? And it goes on here, and we see the picture clearly of Christ on the cross. My enemies stare at me, and they gloat. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing, which is exactly what they did for Jesus, and we'll see that as we prepare and go through this for Easter. He says, oh, Lord, don't stay far from me. You're my strength. You see the turn here? You're my strength. But Lord, when I'm asking why to say, God, I, I need you to be my strength, Lord. I, I need you to help me get to where I can say, I trust you enough to ask what you're doing in me, through me, around me. And he ends with this. The day, uh, David, as he writes this, and Jesus is pointing us toward this. There's a complete shift here. Verse 22, I will proclaim your name among my brothers and sisters. I will praise you. Everybody say praise. praise. To praise is to give God thanks. Why would I thank him even though I, it doesn't feel right? It doesn't, this isn't what I want in my life. I'm going to thank him and praise him because I trust that he has my best at heart and mind. He said, I will praise you among the people. Praise the Lord, all who fear him. Honor him, all you descendants of Jacob. I will praise you in the assembly. I will fulfill my vows. All who seek the Lord will praise him. Wow. Jesus starts out, why, why, why? And that's where we all start. He embraces that for us. He gets that. He understands that. And I'll probably never shift completely away from that. But I want to learn to go from why to what. Because the more I trust God, the less I ask why, the more I ask what. And I want to get to the what faster. What are you doing in my life? How do I do that? Well, I want to give you a few things. And we just see them right there in Psalm 22. Let's read this again together. The more I trust God, the less I ask why. Okay, you guys are using my favorite crowd, so that was not very enthusiastic. Okay, let's, let's have a favor rating right here. Let's read it again with enthusiasm, okay? The more I trust God... The less I ask why, and the more I ask That's why you're my favorite crowd. So what do we do? We see this. Jesus points to this in Psalm 22. We need to thank God that he is good. He's good. God's good. Say it again. Good. good. He's good. That in, in that moment when I'm feeling like, why me? That I, I don't want to forget. Oh, you know what, God? You're good. In that moment, you know, I'm putting the thing on Joel's hand. That he'd say, okay, Dad, this hurts. I don't like this, but I know that you love me. You're good. And you wouldn't do this to be mean to me. God's good. We sang the song, he's a good, good father. Man, as we sing those words, we just sang it this morning. It's so powerful. I want to remember that in the moment where I ask and feel, why me? Why is this happening? God is good. Say it again. Good. He's good. Do you believe it? And in that moment when I don't feel that and I start asking why, I want to be able to say, God, I'm having a little bit of a trust issue here because this doesn't feel good. I don't like this. Would you help me to praise you, to thank you that you are good? Mark 10, 18, Jesus said this. Only God is truly good, and he's only good. He's a good God. I, I love, even as we sang the words of that song, Good, Good Father, the first line of that song says, I've heard what some people say about you, Lord. You know, some of what, man, we hear all kinds of things. Why would a good God let something like that happen? To be able to say, I'm going to trust God so completely that even when I feel like he's abandoned me, I know he's good and I'm going to thank him that he's good. Second thing, let's say this again together. The more I trust God, the less I ask why, the more I ask what. Thank God that he's good. Thank God that he is for me. He's for me. God is for you. He created you as his masterpiece. He has a plan for you, and he is for you. You know, sometimes we feel like, you know, we pop, pop up our head, and God's like this whack-a-mole thing, and he's going, nah, boom. And you pop your head up one more time, and I'm going, that's not God. God's for you. He paid a tremendous price so that you could live out the purpose and plan that he has for your life, and he promises this that that's good. It's a future of hope. In that moment of why, we'll have those moments. And Jesus relates to it. Why have you forsaken me? That I'll come back to the end of Psalm 22 and say, God, 
I trust you so much. I know that you're for me. I want to thank you that you're for me. Even in Jesus, we see that it was the joy. He understood the joy of what God was taking him through, the Father, so that he could, that he would suffer the cross because of us. Thank God that he's for me. Anybody glad for that? Paul says this in Romans. He says, uh, what, what should we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Read it with me. Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? God's for me. So in that moment where I'm asking why, to shift and say, okay, God, maybe I don't feel it, but I'm going to thank you that I know you're for me. Would you help me to trust you that way? Paul goes on, he writes, who dare accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? I'm chosen. Say it. I'm chosen. Uh, I know some of you are saying I don't believe it. Would you just, I got like 10 minutes left. Would you believe it for 10 minutes? Just believe it for 10 minutes and see what that does for your faith. Say it again. I'm chosen. I'm chosen. God's chosen you as to be his, his kid. He's chosen you. You're a king's kid. Whew, I don't believe that. Man, believe it for 10 minutes and then let God just deal with your heart the rest of it, okay? And then those moments where you're saying, why, 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 to come back and say, oh, God's for me. I'm chosen. He has chosen me. No one, uh, no one can be against me for God himself has given us right standing. We have right standing with God. So we need to thank God that he is good. Say it with me. That he is good, that he's for me, and that he is with me. He's with you. You see, the, the more I trust God, the less I ask why, the more I'm going to get to the what. The why is painful. We're going to ask it. But I want to quickly get from that to saying, okay, God, I trust you. What, what are you doing here? I don't want to linger in the why so long that I miss the what. Do you? I've done it. I've done it. I've just lingered there, and God's like, oh, I, can't. I want to get you from there to here, but you keep living in the why. You're missing what I'm trying to do. And for me to understand that, Jeff, this is a trust issue. God, you got to help me because I, I don't see the whole picture. Help me to trust in that way. Help me to continue to trust, to know that he is with me. He's always with us. Jesus himself said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. In Hebrews 13, 5, the writer says, God has said, I will, let's read it together. I'll never fail you. I'll never abandon you. But you've had those moments where you felt like, God has abandoned me. That, that's why we get to that place where we go, why is this happening to me? We feel abandoned. And to get to the place where we can trust God so much to say, I know what I feel, but that's not what's true. What's true is what you say, God. And you said, you will never abandon me. So to be able to get to that place where I say, thank you, God, that you are with me. Now, I want to end just kind of the bookmark. We started out, Jesus' famous last words in, in Psalm 22. He's quoting Psalm 22. He says, why have you forsaken me? Don't miss the end of the, book, the chapter. Jesus doesn't take us there because he, said, because he wants us to feel abandoned. He takes us there and he quotes this, this verse because it's a picture of his crucifixion and you need to see how it ends. It ends with incredible, uh, an incredible shift from why to what and thanking God. Here's how it ends. Psalm 22, verse 23. Let's read it together. I will praise you in the great assembly. I will fulfill my vows in the presence of those who worship you. In other words, being able to thank God. David had written this. Uh, he said his vows were that he would praise and thank God seven times a day. And if you read David's life, he went through a lot of things where you'd say, why would you thank God? Your life is not looking that great. You see, because Christianity is not, if somebody told you this and you're considering being a Christian, you think that, it's, that you'll never have problems again? That's not it. But it's that God gives us the strength to go through those problems. He's with us. And that he has a plan going through it. We can trust him that way. That's why we come back to saying, I praise God. I will thank God to know that he has this. Now, I want you to see how this plays out in our lives. I want you to see the end of the story uh, for Lisa, Scott, and Deidre, and see how they made the shift from why to what, and how powerful it was, a change for them. Watch this. 
I grew older and um, in 2004 I was able to go on a mission trip to Honduras and um, in, some, in my prayer time in Honduras I, was, I prayed and was still asking God why um, and I felt like God revealed to me that he allowed that to happen so um, a passion could be birthed inside of me for students, for youth, for young people. We struggled with the why and um, questioned and God showed us throughout the whole process that he was with us and that he he was holding our Isaiah when we couldn't. But it was during the time when we knew that he was going to leave us, that he was going to, to go be with our Father in heaven, that we knew God was in this. We, we, we knew it was. But it was, it was difficult to get to that place. We, we really wanted him to be healed. But we, had, we began the process of accepting that God was God and God is good. I would never choose to have my father abuse me. But uh, by God allowing that to happen, um, I'm able, as a survivor, I'm able to tell my students that they too can forgive. They too can survive. They too can be healed um, and live with our true Father. Because of that, man, I can experience the love of my true Father, my Heavenly Father, a love that is pure and unconditional. After trying for a year and a half after losing Isaiah, um, we found out this past Christmas that um, I'm pregnant. And um, I have a piece about this pregnancy, and that's something that I feel that God has shown me and um, put on my heart, and he's been faithful, and he's good. They were able to get to the place where they saw the good. And, and I, what you need to hear today is God doesn't cause every circumstance in your life. But as we trust him, he promises that he will use it for our good if we allow him to. That's why we want to get to the place of trust where we say, okay, God, what do you want to do through this? You didn't cause this. Maybe you didn't cause this circumstance, Lord, but what do you want to do in, and through me? And in just a moment, I want, to, I want to pray with you. But before I do, though, would you take out your connection card? And I'm going to ask you to just make a commitment this week, just for the next seven days, that you'd make this your prayer. And then next week, we're going to come back together. And I would encourage you, man, you don't want to miss it. We're going to look at, again, at just at Jesus, what he says from the cross is so powerful for our lives today. And he talks about forgiveness. Next week, I, I'm going to explore his words of Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And how powerful that is for us and how we live that out. It's life-changing stuff. You want to invite some friends and family. Just it'll prepare our hearts for Easter. But this week, let's apply this. And here's what I want, want to make your, make your prayer. And I'm going to be praying for you all week as you... You make this commitment. Let's read it together. I will prayerfully ask God to show me what instead of why when it comes to enduring things I don't understand. So let's just check that off. Church Online, you can do this digitally. There's a tab right there. You can check this. So this week when I get to that point and we're saying, I'm saying, why me? Why me? So I'll say, okay, God, I'm dealing with some trust issues here. Would you help me? I want to ask you what? What do you want to do? Would you show me what you want to do? How are you going to use this in my life? And I want to tell you, in my prayer life, I'm pretty honest with God. I'm pretty honest with saying, I don't like it. I'm ticked about it. But I want to trust you. I need your help. Make that your prayer this week. Would you pray with me? Father, as we come to the end of this talk today and the beginning of this service, I'm so grateful that we can see in your word and your words from the cross what you have for us. First of all, Lord, that you can relate to us is amazing that you embraced that part of your humanity and you cried out, why? And there are so many people listening to my voice right now that are in the moment of why. It's painful. Maybe it's from something of the past or something right now or something going on around them. It's painful. Thank you that you understand that hurt. Lord, we want to get to the place, though, where even when we feel why, even when we cry out, why me, that we can say, but God, I trust you. Would you show me what you're doing in my life? Would you give him the whys right now? You, you felt it as we've been talking. You felt some of those things. Just say, Lord, I need your help here. I'm asking why. 
but I want to know you so well and love you so much and trust you so much that I can say, what do you want to do through me, in me? Now, as we're praying, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus or you're joining us online, you need to know that's where it begins, by putting our faith, our trust in Jesus. And I realize all of this is a huge step of faith, going from why to what. But I'm going to ask you to make that step right now. Just pray this prayer. Say, Lord, I want to invite you into my life. I want to trust you with my life, my future. I want to trust that your plan is good for my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin, my guilt, my shame. And help me now to live out this journey with you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.